Fragments of the Lost Work of Justin Martyr on the Resurrection, translated by M. Dodds. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 1. The Self-Evidencing Power of Truth The word of truth is free, and carries its own authority, disdaining to fall under any skillful argument, or to endure the logical scrutiny of its hearers. But it would be believed for its own nobility, and for the confidence due to him who sends it. Now the word of truth is sent from God, wherefore the freedom claimed by the truth is not arrogant, for being sent with authority, it were not fit that it should be required to produce proof of what is said, since neither is there any proof beyond itself which is God. For every proof is more powerful and trustworthy than that which it proves, since what is disbelieved, until proof is produced, gets credit when such proof is produced, and is recognized as being what it was stated to be. But nothing is either more powerful or more trustworthy than the truth, so that he who requires proof of this is like one who wishes it demonstrated why the things that appear to the senses do appear for the test of those things which are received through the reason is sense but of sense itself there is no test beyond itself as then we bring those things which reason hunts after to sense and by it judge what kind of things they are whether the things spoken be true or false and then sit in judgment no longer giving full credit to its decision so also we refer all that is said regarding men and the world to the truth and by it judge whether it be worthless or no but the utterances of truth we judge by no separate test giving full credit to itself and god the father of the universe who is the perfect intelligence is the truth and the word being his son came to us having put on flesh revealing both himself and the father giving to us in himself resurrection from the dead and eternal life afterwards. And this is Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. He therefore is himself both the faith and the proof of himself and of all things. Wherefore those who follow him and know him, having faith in him as their proof, shall rest in him. But since the adversary does not cease to resist many, and uses many and diverse arts to ensnare them, that he may seduce the faithful from their faith, and that he may prevent the faithless from believing, it seems to be necessary that we also, being armed with the invulnerable doctrines of the faith, do battle against him in behalf of the weak. Chapter 2. Objections to the Resurrection of the Flesh they who maintain the wrong opinion say that there is no resurrection of the flesh giving as their reason that it is impossible that what is corrupted and dissolved should be restored to the same as it had been and besides the impossibility they say that the salvation of the flesh is disadvantageous and they abuse the flesh adducing its infirmities and declaring that it only is the cause of our sins so that if the flesh say they rise again our infirmities also rise with it and such sophistical reasons as the following they elaborate if the flesh rise again it must rise either entire and possessed of all its parts or imperfect but its rising imperfect argues a want of power on god's part if some parts could be saved and others not but if all the parts are saved, then the body will manifestly have all its members. But it is not absurd to say that these members will exist after the resurrection from the dead, since the Savior said, They neither marry nor are given in marriage, but shall be as the angels in heaven. And the angels, say they, have neither flesh, nor do they eat, nor have sexual intercourse. Therefore there shall be no resurrection of the flesh by these and such like arguments they attempt to distract men from the faith and there are some who maintain that even jesus himself appeared only as spiritual and not in flesh but presented merely the appearance of flesh these persons seek to rob the flesh of the promise 
First, then, let us solve those things which seem to them to be insoluble. Then we will introduce in an orderly manner the demonstration concerning the flesh, proving that it partakes of salvation. Chapter 3. If the members rise, must they discharge the same functions as now? They say, then, if the body shall rise entire and in possession of all its members, it necessarily follows that the functions of the members shall also be in existence, that the womb shall become pregnant, and the male also discharge his function of generation, and the rest of the members in like manner. Now let this argument stand or fall by this one assertion. For this being proved false, their whole objection will be removed. Now, it is indeed evident that the members which discharge functions discharge those functions which, in the present life, we see, but it does not follow that they necessarily discharge the same functions from the beginning. And that this may be more clearly seen, let us consider it thus. The function of the womb is to become pregnant, and of the member of the male to impregnate. But as though these members are destined to discharge such functions, it is not therefore necessary that they from the beginning discharge them, since we see many women who do not become pregnant as those that are barren, even though they have wombs. So pregnancy is not the immediate and necessary consequence of having a womb. But those even who are not barren abstain from sexual intercourse, some being virgins from the first and others from a certain time. And we see men also keeping themselves virgins, some from the first and some from a certain time, so that by their means marriage, made lawless through lust, is destroyed. And we find that some even of the lower animals, though possessed of wombs, do not bear, such as the mule and the male mules do not beget their kind, so that both in the case of men and the irrational animals we can see sexual intercourse abolished, and this too before the future world. And our Lord Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, for no other reason than that he might destroy the begetting by lawless desire, and might show to the ruler that the formation of man was possible to God without human intervention. And when he had been born and had submitted to the other conditions of the flesh, I mean food, drink, and clothing, this one condition only of discharging the sexual function he did not submit to. For regarding the desires of the flesh, he accepted some as necessary, while others, which were unnecessary, he did not submit to. For if the flesh were deprived of food, drink, and clothing, it would be destroyed but being deprived of lawless desire, it suffers no harm. And at the same time, he foretold that in the future world, sexual intercourse should be done away with, as he says, the children of this world marry and are given in marriage, but the children of the world to come neither marry nor are given in marriage, but shall be like the angels in heaven. Let not then those that are unbelieving marvel, if in the world to come he do away with those acts of our fleshly members which even in this present life are abolished chapter four must the deformed rise deformed well they say if then the flesh rise it must rise the same as it falls so that if it die with one eye it must rise one eyed if lame lame if defective in any part of the body in this part the man must rise deficient how truly blinded are they in the eyes of their hearts for they have not seen on the earth blind men seeing again and the lame walking by his word all things which the saviour did he did in the first place in order that what was spoken concerning him and the prophets might be fulfilled that the blind should receive sight and the deaf hear and so on but also to induce the belief that in the resurrection the flesh shall rise entire for if on earth he healed the sicknesses of the flesh and made the body whole, much more will he do this in the resurrection, so that the flesh shall rise perfect and entire. In this manner, then, shall those dreaded difficulties of theirs be healed. Chapter 5. The Resurrection of the Flesh is Not Impossible But again of those who maintain that the flesh has no resurrection, 
Some assert that it is impossible, others that, considering how vile and despicable the flesh is, it is not fit that God should raise it, and others that it did not at the first receive the promise. First, then, in respect of those who say that it is impossible for God to raise it, it seems to me that I should show that they are ignorant, professing as they do in word that they are believers, yet by their works proving themselves to be unbelieving, even more unbelieving than the unbelievers. For seeing that all the heathen believe in their idols, and are persuaded that to them all things are possible, as even their poet Homer says, the gods can do all things and that easily, and he added the word easily that he might bring out the greatness of the power of the gods. Many do seem to be more unbelieving than they. For if the heathen believe in their gods, which are idols, which have ears, and they hear not, they have eyes, and they see not, that they can do all things, though they be but devils, as saith the Scripture, the gods of the nations are devils, much more ought we, who hold the right, excellent, and true faith to believe in our God, since also we have proofs of his power, first in the creation of the first man, for he was made from the earth by God, and this is sufficient evidence of God's power, and then they who observe things can see how men are generated one by another and can marvel in a still greater degree that from a little drop of moisture so grand a living creature is formed and certainly if this were only recorded in a promise and not seen accomplished this too would be much more incredible than the other but it is rendered more credible by accomplishment but even in the case of the resurrection the Savior has shown us accomplishments, of which we will in a little speak. But now we are demonstrating that the resurrection of the flesh is possible, asking pardon of the children of the church if we adduce arguments which seem to be secular and physical. First, because to God nothing is secular, not even the world itself, for it is his workmanship. And secondly, because we are conducting our argument so as to meet unbelievers. For if we argued with believers, it were enough to say that we believe, but now we must proceed by demonstrations. The foregoing proofs are indeed quite sufficient to evince the possibility of the resurrection of the flesh, but since these men are exceedingly unbelieving, we will further adduce a more convincing argument still, an argument drawn not from faith, for they are not within its scope, but from their own mother unbelief. I mean, of course, from physical reasons. For if by such arguments we prove to them that the resurrection of the flesh is possible, they are certainly worthy of great contempt if they can be persuaded neither by the deliverances of faith nor by the arguments of the world. Chapter 6. The Resurrection Consistent with the Opinions of the Philosophers those then who are called natural philosophers say some of them as plato that the universe is matter and god others as epicurus that it is atoms and the void others like the stoics that it is these four fire water air earth for it is sufficient to mention the most prevalent opinions and plato says that all things are made from matter by god and according to his design but Epicurus and his followers say that all things are made from the atom and the void by some kind of self-regulating action of the natural movement of the bodies, and the Stoics that all are made of the four elements, God pervading them. But while there is such discrepancy among them, there are some doctrines acknowledged by them all in common, one of which is that neither can anything be produced from what is not in being, nor anything be destroyed or dissolved into what has not any being, and that the elements exist indestructible out of which all things are generated. And this being so, the regeneration of the flesh will, according to all these philosophers, appear to be possible. For if, according to Plato, it is matter and God, both these are indestructible and God, and God indeed occupies the position of an artificer, to wit, a potter, and matter occupies the place of clay or wax or some such thing. 
that then which is formed of matter be it an image or a statue is destructible but the matter itself is indestructible such as clay or wax or any other such kind of matter thus the artist designs in the clay or wax and makes the form of a living animal and again if his handiwork be destroyed it is not impossible for him to make the same form by working up the same material and fashioning it anew so that according to plato neither will it be impossible for god who is himself indestructible and has also indestructible material even after that which has been first formed of it has been destroyed to make it anew again and to make the same form just as it was before but according to the stoics even the body being produced by the mixture of the four elementary substances when this body has been dissolved into the four elements these remain indestructible it is possible that they receive a second time the same fusion and composition from god pervading them and so remake the body which they formerly made like as if a man shall make a composition of gold and silver and brass and tin and then shall wish to dissolve it again so that each element exists separately having again mixed them he may if he pleases make the very same composition as he had formerly made again according to epicurus the atoms and the void being indestructible it is by a definite arrangement and adjustment of the atoms as they come together that both all other formations are produced and the body itself and it being in course of time dissolved is dissolved again into those atoms from which it was also produced and as these remain indestructible it is not at all impossible that by coming together again and receiving the same arrangement and position they should make a body of like nature to what was formerly produced by them as if a jeweler should make in mosaic the form of an animal and the stone should be scattered by time or by the man himself who made them he having still in his possession the scattered stones may gather them together again and having gathered may dispose them in the same way and make the same form of an animal and shall not god be able to collect again the decomposed members of the flesh and make the same body as was formerly produced by him chapter seven the body valuable in god's sight but the proof of the possibility of the resurrection of the flesh i have sufficiently demonstrated in answer to men of the world and if the resurrection of the flesh is not found impossible on the principles even of unbelievers how much more will it be found in accordance with the mind of believers but following our order we must now speak with respect to those who think meanly of the flesh and say that it is not worthy of the resurrection nor of the heavenly economy because first its substance is earth and besides because it is full of all wickedness so that it forces the soul to sin along with it but these persons seem to be ignorant of the whole work of god both of the genesis and formation of man at the first and why the things in the world were made for does not the word say let us make man in our image and after our likeness what kind of man manifestly he means fleshly man for the word says and god took dust of the earth and made man it is evident therefore that man made in the image of god was of flesh is it not then absurd to say that the flesh made by god in his own image is contemptible and worth nothing but that the flesh is with god a precious possession is manifest first from its being formed by him if at least the image is valuable to the former and artist and besides its value can be gathered from the creation of the rest of the world for that on account of which the rest is made is the most precious of all to the maker chapter eight does the body cause the soul to sin quite true say they yet the flesh is a sinner so much so that it forces the soul to sin along with it and thus they vainly accuse it and lay to its charge alone the sins of both but in what instance can the flesh possibly sin by itself if it have not the soul going before it and inciting it 
for as in the case of a yoke of oxen if one or other is loosed from the yoke neither of them can plow alone so neither can soul or body alone effect anything if they be unyoked from their communion and if it is the flesh that is the sinner then on its account alone did the saviour come as he says i am not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance since then the flesh has been proved to be valuable in the sight of god and glorious above all his works it would very justly be saved by him we must meet therefore those who say that even though it be the special handiwork of god and beyond all else valued by him it would not immediately follow that it has the promise of the resurrection yet is it not absurd that that which has been produced with such circumstance and which is beyond all else valuable should be so neglected by its maker as to pass to non-entity then the sculptor and painter if they wish the works they have made to endure that they may win glory by them renew them when they begin to decay but god would so neglect his own possession and work that it becomes annihilated and no longer exists should we not call this labor in vain as if a man who has built a house should forthwith destroy it or should neglect it though he sees it falling into decay and is able to repair it we would blame him for laboring in vain and should we not so blame god but not such one is the incorruptible not senseless is the intelligence of the universe let the unbelieving be silent even though they themselves do not believe but in truth he has even called the flesh to the resurrection and promises to it everlasting life for where he promises to save man there he gives the promise to the flesh for what is man but the reasonable animal composed of body and soul is the soul by itself man no but the soul of man would the body be called man no but it is called the body of man if then neither of these is by itself man but that which is made up of the two together is called man and god has called man to life and resurrection he has called not a part but the whole which is the soul and the body since would it not be unquestionably absurd if while these two are in the same being and according to the same law the one were saved and the other were not and if it be not impossible as has already been proved that the flesh be regenerated what is the distinction on the ground of which the soul is saved and the body not do they make god a grudging god but he is good and will have all to be saved and by god and his proclamation not only has your soul heard and believed on jesus christ and with it the flesh but both were washed and both wrought righteousness they make god then ungrateful and unjust if while both believe on him he desires to save one and not the other well they say but the soul is incorruptible being a part of god and inspired by him and therefore he desires to save what is peculiarly his own and akin to himself but the flesh is incorruptible and not from him as the soul is then what thanks are due to him and what manifestation of his power and goodness is it if he proposed to save what is by nature saved and exists as part of himself for it had its salvation from itself so that in saving the soul god does no great thing for to be saved is its natural destiny because it is part of himself being his inspiration but no thanks are due to one who saves what is his own for this is to save himself for he who saves a part himself saves himself by his own means lest he become defective in that part and this is not the act of a good man for not even when a man does good to his children and offspring does one call him a good man for even the most savage of the wild beasts do so and indeed willingly endure death if need be for the sake of their cubs but if a man were to perform the same acts in behalf of his slaves that man would justly be called good wherefore the saviour also taught us to love our enemies since says he what thank have ye so that he has shown us that it is a good work not only to love those that are begotten of him 
but also those that are without. And what he enjoins upon us, he himself first of all does. Chapter 9. The Resurrection of Christ Proves That the Body Rises If he had no need of the flesh, why did he heal it? And what is most forcible of all, he raised the dead. Why? Was it not to show what the resurrection should be? How then did he raise the dead? Their souls or their bodies? Manifestly both. If the resurrection were only spiritual, it was requisite that he, in raising the dead, should show the body lying apart by itself and the soul living apart by itself. But now he did not do so but raise the body, confirming in it the promise of life. Why did he rise in the flesh in which he suffered, unless to show the resurrection of the flesh? And wishing to confirm this, when his disciples did not know whether to believe he had truly risen in the body, and were looking upon him and doubting, he said to them, Ye have not yet faith, see that it is I. And he let them handle him, and showed them the prints of the nails in his hands. And when they were by every kind of proof persuaded that it was himself, and in the body, they asked him to eat with them, that they might thus still more accurately ascertain that he had in verity risen bodily. And he did eat honeycomb and fish. And when he had thus shown them that there is truly a resurrection of the flesh, wishing to show them this also, that it is not impossible for flesh to ascend into heaven, as he had said that our dwelling place is in heaven, he was taken up into heaven while they beheld, as he was in the flesh. If, therefore, after all that has been said, any one demand demonstration of the resurrection, he is in no respect different from the Sadducees, since the resurrection of the flesh is the power of God, and, being above all reasoning, is established by faith, and seen in works. Chapter 10. The Body Saved, and Will Therefore Rise The resurrection is a resurrection of the flesh which died. For the spirit dies not, the soul is in the body, and without a soul it cannot live. The body, when the soul forsakes it, is not. For the body is the house of the soul, and the soul the house of the spirit. These three in all those who cherish a sincere hope and unquestioning faith in God, will be saved. Considering, therefore, even such arguments as are suited to this world, and finding that, even according to them, it is not impossible that the flesh be regenerated, and seeing that, besides all these proofs, the Savior in the whole gospel shows that there is salvation for the flesh, why do we any longer endure those unbelieving and dangerous arguments? and fail to see that we are retrograding when we listen to such arguments as this, that the soul is immortal, but the body mortal, and incapable of being revived. For this we used to hear from Pythagoras and Plato, even before we learned the truth. If then the Savior said this, and proclaimed salvation to the soul alone, what new thing, beyond what we heard from Pythagoras and Plato and all their band, did he bring us? But now he has come proclaiming the glad tidings of a new and strange hope to men, for indeed it was a strange and new thing for God to promise that he would not keep incorruption in incorruption, but would make corruption in corruption. But because the prince of wickedness could in no other way corrupt the truth, he sent forth his apostles, evil men who introduced pestilent doctrines, choosing them from among those who crucified our Savior. And these men bore the name of the Savior, but did the works of him that sent them, through whom the name itself has been spoken against. But if the flesh do not rise, why is it also guarded? And why do we not rather suffer it to indulge its desires? Why do we not imitate physicians who, it is said, when they get a patient that is despaired of and incurable, allow him to indulge his desires? For they know that he is dying, and this indeed those who hate the flesh surely do, casting it out of its inheritance so far as they can. For on this account they also despise it, because it is shortly to become a corpse. But if our physician, Christ, God, 
having rescued us from our desires regulates our flesh with his own wise and temperate rule it is evident that he guards it from sins because it possesses a hope of salvation as physicians do not suffer men whom they hope to save to indulge in what pleasures they please end of fragments of the lost work of justin martyr on the resurrection translated by m dodds